I'm going to leave you with something quite beautiful tonight, quite sensational, quite moving, hopefully. Now, in the 80s, one of the very best boxers in Britain was Rod Douglas, four times ABA champion, 1984 Olympian, 1986 Commonwealth Games champion. He won his first ABA title at just 18 after 17 senior fights, which might very well be a record for light middleweight. Um, he went to the Olympics at 19. He fought for the British title as a pro, losing to Herald Bomber Graham. He collapsed later that night, had surgery, recovered, and has been amazingly low profile ever since. Well, Rod's back in the boxing business with a gym next to Bethnal Green Chew. But I went to the gym a bit earlier and I talked to Rod. Darren Dyer was also there. Uh, he's working with Rod in the gym. Uh, Darren obviously also won the uh, Commonwealth Games title in 1986 and had an electrifying... And, um, pro career you couldn't take your eyes off his pro career anyway i spoke first to rod and then to darren they were both brutally honest i'd expect that i started by asking rod how long he had been at number nine the arches i've been here approximately 10 months now nine months and uh it's been a long road when i first started there i was here day and night from daylight morning up hammer nails saw drill the whole works, day and night, was about maybe two months, day and night, I was there, working, blood, sweat and tears. And I always remember the first day, I was supposed to get it open on a Friday, and I was still hammering and sawing up until like four o'clock when we were doing our first open session. Done the first session, and when that was over, I had to rush home, get dressed, get changed to go to work in my, in my night job. I remember getting to my, my night job on time and after being there for about half an hour, hour, I just burst into tears because there was so much pressure on me to get the gym open for that time and then get back to work and carry on as normal, but I'd done it. And that was the greatest feeling in the world that I, uh, I achieved there. And the numbers are up now and you're going to be affiliated, be an ABA club? I'm, I'm already affiliated with the ABA. Uh, the numbers grow every month. People come back, they find it tough at first, but they come back again, and they come back again, and they just keep on coming. <laughs> and and they're, bringing, and they're telling their friends, their friend comes, and they seem to enjoy it. And a lot of them really don't have any lots of good skills, or they might have some basic skills, but they, they're loving the, the training, the enjoyment of it. And, and, and you find that it's a split between the white collar people that don't want to fight competitively, they just want to keep fit, or maybe have a white collar bout, and then the guys that want to be amateur boxers and maybe sometime be a pro. Is it 50-50 is it or 60-40, 70-30? No, well, what's you the split? Because the, the split is, I wouldn't say it's a 50-50, but I would say it's more of a 70-30 mm -hmm. of people that want to box, you say the white collar yeah, boxing, yeah. I would, I'd call them the people that are past their youth, yeah. past their, their, their best times of their years, but they want to do a bit of little boxing. And they enjoy it here because I can almost put anybody in the ring with anybody in my gym, regardless of size or weight or age, and no one's going to get hurt. And that's what <laughs> the beauty of this gym is, that everybody enjoys it. It's a good family. Now, the people here that I've been talking to, they say that um, you did fall out of love with the game understandably but you've been away from the game I, mean, I thought you'd vanished I wasn't sure A if you were still living in the East End and B if you were well it's a delight to say that you're both those things um, what made you what, what was it that sort of made you think I'll get back involved what was it to tell the truth and I'll be totally honest with it and you might not like to hear me say it after I finished fighting or after I got retired from yeah. boxing, I still had that fight in me. I still had that unfinished well, that's, that's business. Like once you come out of hospital and stuff, like once instantly, hospital, you still want right, to fight. Right. Once, still yeah. want to win a British title. Still wanted to fight. I still had some unfinished business. Yeah. Okay, I didn't win the world title, world title, didn't win the British title on that, so I still had that fight in me. I knew the board wouldn't give me a license to continue fighting, so I started practicing Muay Thai, kickboxing. So I started doing the kickboxing, enjoying it, and then and then I ended up teaching the Muay Thai fighters how to use their hands. Had you done Muay Thai before you boxed? Never, never. You had to learn from scratch? I learned from scratch, learned how to use my feet, used to learn, use my hands. Yeah, I was probably past my cell by day, but I was still enjoying getting in the ring and having a spa and having a bit of a kick around. Are there headshots in Muay Thai? Of course there is. Of course what do you mean, of course there is? I'm you? fine, I'm fine. <laughs> well, I know you're fine, but... Yeah. Well, it's the board saying I can't have a license no more. But um, cut a long story short, I started doing this uh, training, the, the, the Muay Thai fighters, trying to make to use their hands. And then a friend of mine. That's George. 
no Bill, Bill yeah. Judd, good friend of mine. Uh, good, friend. good friend became terminally ill. Okay. Okay. And uh, the gym where I was training at his gym, training these fires, got a little bit small. So he, he rang me up one day. He said, "Look, Rod, I've got something for you. I want to show you something." So he brought me down to this gym. There was nothing in there, just an empty shell. He says, "Me, look at this, Rod. I think you can do something with this." But I couldn't visualise what he was showing me. Couldn't see it. No. So we looked around. I kind of half agreed with him. Shook my head. I came out. He shut the door. He went to me here. He gave me the keys. He said, "That's yours." And then in the next breath, he said to me, I've got cancer. So, in one breath, I'm happy, got my own gym. In the next breath, but this is what he's done for me. I put all my time in at his gym for a couple of years, only because of the love of the sport. Yeah. Never took a penny out of it. And this is how he's repaid me. So he kind of stuck me in at the deep end yeah. to get on with it, but I've just got a new lease of life. And I have uh, Darren Dyer, no, we'll, talk to, we'll talk to Darren in a minute. He's lurking. He thinks he's going to get away, but he won't get away. Yeah. Uh, don't worry. Uh, a good friend of mine has been around. We've been together for we a few years. Together. Went to Commonwealth Games together. Went to Commonwealth Games together. together. Squads together. Or oh, what passed for squads back then? Not the same as that's now. That's right. That's right. It's all totally different now. So he's down there helping me, helping me now. He's a very good uh, teacher and mentor for the amateur fighters and that. And uh, we've got a good team down here. Let me take you back a little bit. Well, because when you won the ABA's first time, mm -hmm. uh, 83, at uh, light middleweight, it was only your 17th senior contest, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Now, that's not, not a record, but it ain't far off. For light middleweight, it probably was a record. Had you boxed as a junior, though? Was that just senior? Yeah, I, I won the junior, junior ABA's at uh, 16, my first time entry, mm. uh, 16, and then I had, I like I said, 14 or 15 senior fights. Yeah, first time I entered the competition, but at them times... My high grade used to meet in the middle. I was very fit. Yeah. Always trained hard. You had the angry look. Yeah, you? and I'm, I'm, I'm going in there, man. Yeah. Uh, teeth and tongs, like, full out. And I ain't stopped punching until the referee steps stop or the bell goes. Yeah, and that's I, it. I remember that much. Then you went to the Olympics. won again in 84. Went to the Olympics out in Los Angeles. And you won, won a couple of times out there. I had two fights. One fight against a, a, a Japanese policeman from Tokyo. My second fight was against a Kenyan soldier. <laughs> Two tough fights. So you're like the military champion yeah, in the Olympics? Yeah, and then you know, the next fight, in the quarterfinals, I was fighting, uh, no, the fight before the quarterfinals, fighting Sean O'Sullivan. Yeah, that brilliant. was for a medal, and he was a very good fighter. Yeah. Uh, maybe experience-wise, I went into the Olympics with a lot of, lot of yeah. fighting experience, but I had a big art. You still only, well, I think you're 19 at the Olympics. I just think you're 19, 19, yeah. Just turned 19. So you came back from then. Now, a lot of people, I mean, even then, and especially now, would have turned pro. You're 19, you've just come back from the Olympics, you've won a couple of fights, you've lost to a really good fighter, who in turn lost to a really good fighter. So what made you, what made you stay amateur? Because everybody expected me to come back with a medal a gold medal so I had a lot of responsibility on me when I was going when I came back with nothing it was like I've got to go for it again so half of me wanted to stay amateur until the next Olympic Games sure. I had such a great games that I had to experience it again but that time one year goes past two years go past three years go past and you ain't as fast yeah. as you used to be, and then you need a bit more time. Yeah, you need a few more rounds. Few, you need a couple more minutes to recover in between rounds, and I was just getting too old. And of course, it's, it's 85 and 86 that you had the two fights with Nigel Benn. You won the first, 85, your call. You won the second, just up the court, just up the road here, 86, your call. Controversial ending, yeah. as everyone is, yeah. as everyone tells me, and I can remember it clearly. I wrote about it in the Evening Standard. Um, and then. 86, though, you still got the call up for the Commonwealths. Yes. Again, you're on a plane with Darren. Darren Dyer, yes. So so we're only to Edinburgh. Uh, All those uh, exotic places, uh, and you end up getting Edinburgh. End up going to Edinburgh. Had a good games in Edinburgh. Uh, me and Darren, I've saved his life, but he might tell you later on. I'll ask in him, don't I? In the swimming pool. Um, um, he's, not, he's, not, he's not known for his swimming, though. He was a banger, <laughs> really, really. No disrespect, say. <laughs> so. The thing was, we was all treading water. Finished training in the, in the, in the, in the gym, we've all gone into the jumped into the swimming pool and we're all treading water and it says six foot yeah, 
Yeah. Right? <laughs> of course. Six foot is taller than me. <laughs> so there's Darren. He sees us all treading water. He thinks we're standing up. <laughs> 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 so he's jumped so he in. in. <laughs> <laughs> and look up and <laughs> no, I just had to get him and, and take him to the side. Wasn't James Joy Bowler there? We could have just lifted well, him up that, by his thing, head. James Joy Bowler was in the water. <laughs> and of course, you right, right, right. <laughs> no, but he's standing up. So Darren thinks that he uh, can stand up as well. He's six foot nine. Right. But I never think, I didn't think like, no, nothing of me getting Darren to the side and that. But every time I've seen him since, he always tells people how I saved his life. <laughs> it must have been a great experience. Nice gave you a tenner. For saving his love, you'd be a rich man, wouldn't you? Every time. every time we said it, yeah. <laughs> so then you, you, you win again, you, you 87, you win again, this time at middleweight, upper middleweight, That's and then you, right. you finally turn pro. Um, was, it, was it at that point, was it hard to resist the people trying no, to get you to turn pro? What were your feelings about turning pro? My first, the second fight with, that I had with Nigel Ben, a uh, very questionable decision, yeah. but it was my first fight at, at middleweight. middleweight. So I had to justify myself that I was still good enough at middleweight to win the ABA titles. Anyway, got the call up to go to the Commonwealth Games at middleweight, won the gold medal, middle, gold medal at middleweight. Um, but then Nigel Benz already turned pro yeah. and people are talking about it. Yeah. Michael Watson's turned pro, turned pro people are talking him. about him. And all these guys that I consider myself above yeah. We're kind of making a name to themselves in a pro. So and then there's me. Douglas. Yeah, and there's me fighting for a trophy. Yeah. And these guys are fighting for money. So what's the matter with me? Just, you know, go and get some money out of it. So that's why I turned pro in the end. But I wasn't really at a great level of professional ranks. You know? I think you moved too fast as a pro. No, because I think if you do the training, you can do. You can. And you had that amateur yeah. experience. I had that amateur experience, and I, I like to believe that I'm a hard trainer. Yeah. So if you move too far, you know, you just adapt your training so that you can do the distance at a certain uh, pace or a certain rate. Because you, you stepped up, you know, your competition. You didn't have two years of grace against guys that you could easily beat, did you? In all fairness, no. you want to quite a. Yes. You're quite a steep learning curve. A very steep learning curve, honest, curve. Yes. and a lot of people uh, would argue that maybe Mickey Duff put me in at the wrong time for the British title fight, especially with yeah. somebody of Earl Graham's uh, reputation. But if you look at the record books and you look at Earl Graham was the British champion for the previous, I don't know, five years or something like that. And maybe it was the right time. Right? As I try, he just lost on a split decision to Mike McCullum for the yeah. world title. Yeah. So the gamble was that he wouldn't be able to motivate himself enough for, to for defend. He's a relative novice, exactly. he just fought with Rate McCullough. Exactly. But um, if you look at the record books, or you look at my style of fighting, and you look at El Graham's style of fighting, I was probably purposely made for the right. type of fight that Errol fights. That's why you didn't get Nigel Benn fighting Errol yeah, yeah, Graham. You right. didn't get Chris Eubank fighting Errol. More him. importantly, you didn't get Marvin Agler there you fighting Errol Graham. That's right, because he's a, he's a great fighter, but he's not a crowd puller, so you ain't going to make no money from sending some tickets from him. But you did get Rod Douglas fighting him. Yeah, I would fight was, anybody. Which was a fateful fight, in Of course, yes, I'd fight anybody. I wouldn't refuse anybody. And I always remember, I, uh, on the way home from the fight... From the Douglas? From, from, the, from, the, from the Graham fight? Graham fight. I was on my way home, and I'm starting to be sick out the car window, but I didn't think too much of it. Had that happened before, Rod? Can you no, remember? No, no, first time. And I remember being sick, and I had this terrible headache, terrible, terrible headache. And I got out of the car, and I went to my front door, and I couldn't even climb up the four or five steps to go into my house to sit on the steps. About five minutes later, my sister came along, said to me, Rod, what's the matter? I said, oh, I've got a terrible headache. Because all my mates and friends were waiting for me down the pub. Oh, to go down and celebrate. And go and celebrate or commemorate yeah, or whatever. You're still going to do it. We're not lose, weren't you? Yeah. Right, still going to do it. Uh, and then uh, I had this terrible headache. She, said, she just picked me up by the arm, says, Right, come on, put me in the car, took me down to the hospital. And I was quite fortunate enough that before I turned professional, I used to work at the hospital as That's the hospital porter. So all the staff that was on duty at that time saw me come in, knew that I had a headache, and they knew and straight knew away you. what it was, exactly. So that's why I got seen to so quickly and so uh, so, so so fast. And that saved my life. It did save your life? Yes, definitely. And it was it John Sutcliffe that did? Was Peter's... Peter, uh, John. 
John Sutcliffe, Peter C Yeah, I always get the two of them mixed Something up. Like that. John Sutcliffe, yeah. John Sutcliffe, yeah, the, the neurosurgeon. The, neuro, yeah. the same neurosurgeon that done the same with uh, Michael Watson. Michael Watson, yeah. As well, yeah. And Robert Darko. Robert Darko. Yeah, there's a few of them. And he was, he, yeah, he did he a good, good job. surgeon, very good yeah, surgeon. He did save a life. Definitely, definitely. So I mean, you know, I, I came back and I remember the, the, the first time I woke up from a, a coma and I woke up and I opened my eyes. My wife was sitting there and she said to me, you know you can't fight no more, don't you? That's one of the first things she said to me and I said, oh, don't be silly. I just put it at the back of my mind, thinking of all, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And then about an hour later, Mickey Duff hey, in the changing room with Colin Hart, give me a chance to get my faculties about myself. But he came in and he told me that I can't fight no more. That's the end of my boxing career. And when I heard it from his mouth, I broke down and cried. Because then I knew that my career was finally over. Was it tough then, the months after that? Like the the months and years after that? Because it took me approximately two years to recover. Because I couldn't walk properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had no coordination. Couldn't put my hand. Again. Couldn't find my, half, my mouth, hand mouth coordination. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't remember where my mum lived. You know, lots of little things I had to battle to get back up to the did, scratch again. Did you feel that your, the bits were coming back to you day by day, Rod? Like, you, did you feel you were getting better day by day, as hard as it was? Well, as hard as it was, it took time for me to get back into shape. I had an argument with Michael Watson at his bedside. When he was, that, in, when when he he was, was in the same situation. Yeah. And, and every time I used to go up to the hospital, his mum, her eyes used to light up. Joan. She was, Joan, she she was really pleased to see me for the situation, I was in the same situation with what, what Michael was in, and she saw hope through yeah, for me, you. for Michael. But his situation was right? far but more he, severe. Far more severe, but then I, I spoke to him on the edge of I said, Michael, man, listen, you've got to get yourself together. You've got to get up out of that bed. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. You can't just sit back and let nature take its course. Yeah, yeah. For me, it was about, all, like I said, learning to do this again, learning to do it. But I kept at it. Kept pushing. I, I had arguments with my wife because she wanted to feed me no, and I wanted to feed you. myself. Right. So in my eyes, I think it works if you're persistent, yeah. if, you've got, if you're determined to get yourself better, you can get yourself better. Although Michael was in a bit more worse situation yeah. than myself, but I think a lot of that helps. You know, there's a young kid, I went to see him the other day in um, Burton, um, John Joe Finnegan, super middleweight, he lost a fight. Day before Olympics, 27th, uh, same thing, head injury, injury, coma. But he's come round now. But he's come round really. He's come round really angry. He wants to fight. And I'm gonna. I'm gonna play him this. I'm gonna. I'm doing a charity event with him tomorrow. I'm going up oh, to. Yeah. He's still in hospital. I'm going to see his mum tomorrow and doing an auction at some place up in Burton in the Midlands. And I want to take this tape because he wants. He has, he won't accept that he can't fight and he can't walk at the moment. He won't accept he can't walk. He won't accept he can't go to the toilet. I want him to accept that he can't. Walk. I want to get on his feet and. Do it, excuse my friend. Just right. start walking. You know, it's hard, it's difficult. Coordination might be, it might fall over a couple of times, but he's a fighter, so you've got to get up and start fighting and starting to walk again. If I can do it, anybody can do it. And look at me now. <laughs> so come, let's get back to good things, positive things. Come when's going to be your next show? Where you got, right, coming right, up? Right, Talk to right, me. Right. I've got some boys fighting tomorrow. I've got four guys fighting tomorrow. It's my first, I've had a couple of shows pre season. Yeah. Uh, we had a couple of youngsters on, but I've got my first fight show tomorrow in High Wickham. I've got four more senior guys fighting. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited about it. I just want to get them on. I don't know how to compare my boxers from how I train them, what they're going to be like with other boxers being trained by other people. So it'd be good for me to see, you know, how I'm matching. I like to think that all my fighters are fit. Yeah. And if they wasn't fit, I wouldn't. And they're boxers, all yeah. boxers. So I ain't got no brawlers or nothing no, like that. Um, so I'd like to think that I've put enough in them and, and Darren himself has put enough training in them to get them fit. If they can free, finish the three rounds, I'll be happy. Yeah. Let's call him over, Darren. Come over here a minute. Now, first of all, let's clear, let's clear up the swimming situation. <laughs> why, why did you jump in a six-foot swimming pool knowing <laughs> you weren't necessarily a great swimmer, Darren? 1986 well, Edinburgh, go on and ask you. You know, well, funny enough, you know, we was all having fun right now, to tell the truth, and it's like James Odebola is so tall. So I'm thinking right now it was the shallow end, you know what I mean, you know, at the end of the day. So I've jumped in right now and realising it's not the shallow end. But I don't think anyone really noticed right now the problems couldn't I was just, in. Couldn't you just make out you're all right though? Was well, it too, was it too well, dangerous? Well, you trying to make out it's all cool? I'm all right to dive in the water and swim underwater. I'm okay with that. <laughs> 
But coming back up right now, <laughs> that was the problem. Do you know what I mean? And I think Rod kind of saw me while I was in a bit of problems. <laughs> and I tried to style it off, really. I'm do you know what I mean? That's what I was trying to say. Can you try that? Do you see what I'm saying? I did. I think I did. I think I styled it off well. At the end of the day, no one really noticed what apart was going Rod. down apart from Rod. And I don't even think Rod really knew what he was doing. It was just his natural instincts. To save you. Just save me, you know what I mean? But he pushed me to the side and I was like, oh, God. I just jumped out of the wall and that was it. Now, you both won gold medals. Um, uh, you both won gold medals in Edinburgh in 1986. So uh, you at Welter, Rod up at middle. And there's lots of other British fighters in the finals and the semis. There's a massive turnout of English fighters and Scots and Welsh fighters. And then... You turned you turned pro straight away, didn't you? You didn't wait a year. You went later. You went I late had, in '86. Didn't I you? had no choice right now to turn pro. Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day, I think a lot of managers was really around jumping me, all over you. jumping all over me at the same time as well. And plus, where I was training at Coverstone and training with Michael Watson, and knowing that Michael Watson turned pro a year and a half, two years just before me. So I think at that time right now, I was ready to you turn ready pro, to but I wasn't ready. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, I mean, the you amateurs... You realise that now? No, it's not that. I think with the Commonwealth Games right now, we had another three years. Three, no, we had another two years for the Olympics. Yeah. And how old would you, would you have been, Darren, in, in 88 in Seoul, if you'd have stayed two more years? I would have been about 21. So you'd still been a baby? Do you know what I mean? It still would have been a baby right now. At the end of the day, I must have turned pro when I was 19 years old. Yeah, I think you did. But at the same time, I think all the amateurs right now, they were saying to me, stay amateur for another two years and we'll give you 200 pound every week and that was a way of saying to me yes yeah, stay amateur do you know what i mean you know but at the same time i thought you know with mickey duff thinking he was the main man and with training with michael watson and training with all the pros right now i thought it was ready for me to turn pro but it was a big mistake because that colverston gym uh, was obviously for dennis andrews would have been in and out kirkland was in and out Various other lunatics and crank characters that have been out. Watson was there with uh, with Eric, and then and you as well. So it was a it was a healthy pro environment that gym, wasn't it? It was like a pro gym, really. Exactly, exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, when I started amateur right now at the age of 11, I mean, I mean, back in the day right now, it was a no no. Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day, the and amateurs. You around pros, e exactly, you? exactly. Do you know what I mean? It was a no no, but. It was so much teaching right now, do you know what I mean, at the end of the day for me, because I had so much pros around me. I started off turning and looking at pros with Mo was saying, mm, do you know what I mean, because Mo was down at uh, Coverstone, you know, and even though it's still with Mo was saying and Morris Hope, do you know what I mean, at the end of the day, and then from Morris. Mid-70s, so mid, mid to late 70s. You see what I'm saying? So it was a long time. I turned, well, doing boxing at 79. I started at 79. Do you know what I mean? And like doing the amateurs right now at 81 or something like that, do you know what I mean? So I had so much pros around me. So, yeah. I was sparring at the same time with Bozo Edwards, you know what I mean? Yeah. And all that kind of guys. Let, let me ask you this, Darren. Um, you, you and Rod, you've got this fantastic setup here. Rod's Jim the Art is just by Bethnal Green Tube Station. Not near the overground station. Although it's a nice walk from the overground station, I've got to tell you. That's, not, that's another story. And let me ask you this. The amateur setup, you're going to start working with the amateurs, both men and women, um, obviously. This should be, you should have, you should be a hotbed here, shouldn't it? You should be able to drag some fantastic fighters in here. It's gonna be big, it's gonna be big. It's gonna be massive right now at the same time as well. The way Rod and Bill right now has got it all organized right now, there's gonna be no mistake, do you know what I mean, when it comes down to it. Rod right now is looking after certain older guys, do you know what I mean, when it comes down to it. He's looked at me and he said, do you know what, Darren? At the end of the day, where you've done a little bit of amateur fighting, and amateur coaching already from another gym sure. called Pedro. Do you know what I mean? Right now, it's for you right now to concentrate on the amateurs. I want, through. yeah, and bring them through. Where he said that to me, Rod, he said, look after the amateurs right now, train them up, get them through. Hopefully by the new season, we'll get them carded up, doctored, medicaled, and get ready to fight. Do you know what I mean? It's a slow process, the amateurs. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good pros, and I classify both of you as good pros that work with amateurs and think it's going to be overnight. It's not overnight, what is it? It's three and four year plan before you... You might have a bit of success, a fluke fighter, but generally it's a slower process. It is so not short very job, slow. is it? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, when Rod starts speaking to me right now at the end of the day, and I said, OK, starts all over with the amateurs. I phoned up the Scottish girl right now who won the gold medal last year for the Harry For the Harry yeah. That's when and I she it, was it. the best kind of, like, uh, girl boxer I've ever seen. I never agreed with girl boxing. Until you saw her. Until I saw her. Yeah. So now, 
the end of the day, do you know what I mean? I'm training some of the girls now, do you know what I mean? And when it comes down to it, I just phoned her two days ago right now. And she said, well, I hope Rod Douglas is going to like me, do you know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm on my way down. Two weeks, she, she's coming down. She's going to sign up with this club right now. Do you know what I mean? Because in Scotland, they don't respect women doing the boxing. So it's hard for her to have a fight. And so she's down here, she'll be fine, man. And last, this year, was just gone with Harringay. There was no one in her way. So she couldn't fight. And I was so, sh you know, it was horrible. Because I had three other Scottish girls looking after. And they all lost the fight. But the main girl was, was Christiane. Yeah, I've got a Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day. But she's coming over in two weeks' time to see Rod. And she's coming down to train at Rod's gym. Do you know what I mean? So we'll... We're about to. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We'll, do uh, we'll come back in November. And I'll get the pair of you in on my uh, Box Nation sofa. Sooner rather than later. That's Good. not rubbish. Rod? Nice to meet you, Steve. You. Darren? Steve? Pleasure, brother. Thanks for meeting you. Thanks very much, man. Cheers, my pleasure.